So today's lesson is really just going over financial products in the industry. I'm gonna look at the pros and cons and we're gonna just talk about like proper timing. Like how do we understand first what each financial product is at its core without the strategy attached? So many of us confuse strategies with the product or product with the strategy. I think it should be separate. I think if we get sold on the, on the base principle facts of each and every one of these financial products, then we go into the world in the marketplace and we find the guru, the, the author, the speaker to then educate us on a strategy. If it matches with the, the base of this financial product and it's in alignment with your morals and values and principles, then we can proceed with the strategy. But if we're always looking at one metric, which is ROI, rate of return, What's the highest rate of return I can get? I'm seeing the, the, the negative effects of always looking at ROI. What's the, what's the biggest you know, cash flow return I can, I can get on this investment? Rather than first tying it to morals, values, and principles, understanding what this product actually was built for. Does the strategy fit well with the product or are we forcing a particular strategy on this product, right? And if I relate it to say velocity banking, like. Many of us in the room here have been practicing velocity banking. There's been times where some of you force velocity banking into your strategy, into your finances, and it ends up not being efficient. When, when we rely on our principles, values, and rules of leverage of velocity banking, we can let the math typically tell us which direction to go into. And then we can verify emotions with the, 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 the feelings, that, that current state that we're in. For example, I'm now in debt. I'm no longer a debt-free man. I now have a, a mortgage, right? It's, it's a first position home equity line of credit. I'm doing velocity banking, all this stuff. I've ran the numbers, trust me, on my own stuff. And I have videos coming out where I show you my case study. I show you all my numbers in detail. I could make way more money by not paying off my first lien HELOC and just making the interest only payment. I could make way more money by simply redirecting the cash flow back into the business and just claim a deduction of all the interest that I pay off my taxable income, make more money, right? Higher rate of return. That is the potential. The issue is all of the emotions that come with being a new homeowner. I simply just don't like having on the property of that magnitude. Close December 21st, it's now the original debt amount starting was 567,000, currently at 383,000, and we're only a couple months in, right? So my, my strategy is to have this fully paid off within three years or less. And then if I wanna leverage it how I wanna leverage it, cool. But being able to just be done with it over the next three years, that's just my focus. Like I'm, I'm saying no to Bitcoin. I'm saying no to Ethereum. I'm saying no to stocks. I'm saying, I'm saying no to a lot of other opportunities because I know how much this can affect my personal productivity, my ability to create value in the marketplace. I think I operate best when I have either no debt or all the debt is in my policy. I just, right? Like that's just how I am, how I'm wired. But you may not be wired that way, so don't be influenced by me. I'm just simply explaining just my, my process, what I'm going through, and it's important to evaluate emotional position with your financial strategy. How are these things, right? And if they're out of whack, out of alignment, hey, let's have a conversation. Let's dive, dive right into it, okay? Got to know our numbers. Very, 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 very important. What are our four major numbers before... I invest before I go hook up with that guru online and buy his or her $20,000 program. What are my numbers? Get very, very, very clear on that. Please, please, please. Let's say you have your numbers and you know, you're watching my videos, you're watching other people's videos, all these different finance channels. You're hearing all these different strategies, right? So I figured, let me write down some of the most popular financial products that are in the marketplace. I want to go one by one and just ex simply explain like the, f the, the simple function of the account. And then we can have a conversation back and forth about 
the timing as to when to get these accounts, if it even makes sense. And also, you know, touching on the different strategies that exist in the marketplace that may or may not make sense for that particular product. So I'm going to start with, then I'll throw in an opinion and I'll let you know, like, okay, here is my opinion about that product. And this is going to help you really uh, have a certain set of lens Every time you watch a new video from a different content creator, when you go and do research online, you read articles and you read books, you're gonna be able to cipher through fact. Sometimes opinions look like facts when it comes to the finance space because of that person's influence, stature, financial net worth. Sometimes what they say becomes what? Truth. I wanna put myself on the spot as well. What you may hear me say on, on the YouTube videos, oftentimes, more often than not, I'm saying, right? opinion. Okay. Here's what I think. Here's what I would do if I was in this situation. Here's what we decided to do when I was working with the client. Whether you'll hear me go through the case studies. I'm like, here's a client. Da -da -da -da. Here's our situation. Here's their goals based on their situation, their goals. Here's the solution. We I'm talking to that client, but I'm displaying to everyone. So now you have to take that extra step as the viewer to not just take it as truth immediately, but you want to run the numbers. You want to run it through your financial decision-making process and say, okay, this is for me. This is not for me. And the biggest thing that we, we must be aware of that will happen, okay, happens all, happens to me is the FOMO. The fear of missing out is so real. Like literally some of you get stomach pain. Oh my God, I missed out on that financial opportunity. Oh my God, if I would have just da 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 da. Some of you guys twist. Your minds go into, a, 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 you spiral out because you think you're missing out on something enough. I'm like, look, if we have a process in place, I promise you, you'd never miss out on anything. Because if the opportunity was truly for you, our Father in heaven will make it happen for you, especially for my believers in the room. Like, come on. If God wants something for you, trust in him, not me. Trust in him. He is going to make a way for you. But that's only if you're going by his will and not your ability to make something happen. Another example, it's happening right now in my life. I have an opportunity that is right in front of me. It's at the final stages. This could, this has the potential to blow my business up to the point where it, like it could break. So much money coming in so many more clients coming in, in in the coming months where where it'll literally get to a point where you'll probably never hear me sell anything of of my stuff on my own channel for a while right like i'm just gonna like oh can't take no clients because from this one lead source i could potentially be getting just a massive amount of business get super busy lazy laser focused right <clears throat> crazy what what the potential is of that the whole way through I haven't been forcing anything to make this happen. This literally was all God. Someone else said something about me in another room that I'm not even qualified to be in because that other person knows me and they they vouch for me. They they spoke highly of me. Then I get in a room and now I'm talking to, to these people and we're going back and forth and now we're in the contract phase of it. This potential joint venture could be game over, right? In terms of like, could be set. For, for years to come uh, in terms of income. But if I try to force this to make it happen quicker, to, to do something, to make it uh, make the deal spicier, or more attractive for them, I could be getting in my own way of success if I don't rely on my father's will and his timing. And me just show up every day, keep showing up every day, keep doing your thing, keep doing exactly what he's telling me to do, okay? Very, very important. I felt a little FOMO in that opportunity because I'm like, oh my God, if I if I don't say this, if I don't do that, if I, I could lose this opportunity, da, 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 da. released it back to God. I said, I'm, a, I'm gonna remove this, Lord. This is in your time, this is in your hands. I will not get in the way of your will to make my life successful and abundant. Not gonna get in the way of that. So FOMO is very real, right? It, 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 it's right there in front of you, constantly happens. Evaluate your last three financial major decisions. Think about, did you run it through a process or did you have one phone call? Did you go on one landing page and then boom, you gave them 30 grand, 50 grand, some random YouTuber, content creator, guru, financial person, bought the policy, bought the product. And you're just like, now you're wondering, uh, I don't even know what this does. I deal with that so much and I'm like, wow, that's interesting. Let's dig deeper. Let's figure out why we got there. How did we get there, right? So let's start with qualified retirement accounts. Most of you all know this. Mostly everyone in the room has one of these. 
401k loan, right? uh, 401ks, 403bs, right? any type of qualified retirement account deferred, you get a deduction with these types of accounts off your current income today. So you pay lesser taxes. So the uh, these are all facts so far. Qualified retirement accounts are tax deferred. You pay taxes later. You get the deduction now off your income and the money grows in the account tax. So you're not paying any taxes on the growth. These accounts have different types of costs internally in there. That majority of you have no idea what those costs are. These are facts. Most people don't know what it costs to operate these things. Some people think there's no cost at all because there wasn't necessarily like a salesperson telling them to get the 401k it was their employer saying here's our plans that that we have and then you just kind of pick but just know that there's someone on the back end that's receiving commissions every financial product that we see here someone else is getting paid always keep that in mind someone else is getting paid how do they get paid may influence whether you decide to have this product or not right so you may make your decision based on the facts of the product or how the product operates in terms of its costs, its fees, its structure, or like many of us, we're, we're just making a decision based on ROI, the highest rate of return I can get. So these qualified retirement accounts, tax, tax deferred deduction, there's fees, there's costs. Okay. These are all facts, higher risk, right? Meaning can I lose money in this account? <clears throat> that is a possibility how much I can lose. Technically, you could lose all your money in these types of accounts, but it's not sold that way. These are sold as safe way for retirement and growth. When you reach 59 and a half, you can now access the money however you so please. Lump sum, little by little, percentage amount, where many people, here's opinion now coming in, and whenever you hear someone says when many people or most people, typically that's, you know, like an opinion. It's going to help you uh, really master your ability to watch content and, and process financial information. Based on my experience working with many of you in the room here who have had a conversation with me one-on-one, -on -one, many people, when they get to 59 and a half and, and older, they don't know how to withdraw money from their retirement accounts. They don't know how much is too much or how much is too little or what they need from a for retirement. They just simply just don't know what they don't know. Because of that one fact, it truly doesn't matter how much money is in the retirement account. That one fact right there of not knowing how much to withdraw, where the money would outlast the individual, right? Or, or take them through retirement. That one fact of not knowing could destroy their whole financial account there. What do I mean by that? If someone has $2 million in a retirement account and they're going to safely withdraw 8% of their money because a guru named Dave Ramsey, you can withdraw 8% because you're going to earn 12% on average without accounting fees and costs internally in the 401k without accounting for taxes, which is an expense at that later date and without factoring in losses. There are years, this is a fact, there are years your investments can and will lose money because your investment is tied to the stock market. The stock market does lose money. A, a, period of time, it will lose money. And in those years that you lose money, let's say you had $2 million in your account, do some quick math, and your account drops by 10% one year. So my friend, you lost $200,000 in one year. You're 63 years old. You have $2 million in a, in a, in a 401k, let's say, and you lose 10%. So you lose 200 grand, mind you, you're no longer contributing dollars. So we just lost 200,000. Take it to the whiteboard. Quick little example here. $2 million, lose 10%, 200K. Let's say you're paying 2% in, in annual fees. So let's do, I don't know how the fees come out, whether it's on a monthly basis or annual. So I'm just going to use an annual number. Let's say, let's say right on December 31st, it ends off at 1.8 million and that's when they charge their fee it's times that by two percent 
let's say. So you pay 36,000 in fees, even though your financial advisor or account, the person that's managing your 401k just lost 200 grand, they're still gonna get paid uh, you know, a portion of that 36 grand that goes into admin fees and all kinds of fees, 36,000. Because you start off at $2 million, you do an 8% withdrawal, you take out 160 grand. That's 8% of 2 million, 160,000. Dave Ramsey told me, this is what I can do. $2 million, I'm gonna withdraw 8% because I'm earning 12. But what he didn't tell me was the year that I lose money, do I still pull out the 160? We didn't go into that. I still pay a fee, all right? And I lost money that year. So we got 160 pulled out and of the 160, what's your tax bracket? What, 30%, 48 grand? So pff, minus that, what are you left with? 118, 160 minus 48, so minus taxes, 112,000. That's what you net, about nine grand a month. Okay, cool. So let's let's run the whole math. 1.8 million, 36,000 in fees, minus 160,000. I'm at a million six, one year. How many more years can that 63 year old lose money from 63 to 80, 85 before all that is gone, right? What if they had back-to-back -back negative years? Has that happened in the market before? Pretty sure, and look at it. So if we lose money, let's say the stock market loses money every five years, you're still paying fees every single one of those years. And in order to make this all back, right, you would have to earn what? 40%? Yeah, you have to make 30, 40 plus percent to get back to what it could have been if you actually would have generated 12% that year. A million times, say 12%, say it goes up, and then you minus, you know, 2% in fees, which was, let me do that again, so 2 million, let's say we would have earned 12%, so now we're at 240 plus the 2 million times 2% in fees, then that don't look like much, right? Obviously, and then you minus your 160, and then yeah, you're good. There's still money in there. But that's not every year. And and let me tell you, losing 200 grand, even though there's the potential that you can recover, you still lost that money. We still lost that money. And if anyone you know is above 59 and a half in 2007, 2008, how much did they lose in their retirement account? How many 58, 59 year olds were turning 59, 60 in 07, 08, how many of those men and women got a million dollars, 800,000 in my 401k, and then overnight, it's down to 400 grand. That's intense. And then you expect that person to withdraw 8%, 4% safe withdrawal rate. Like there has to be a, a conversation on this. So there's something called sequence of return. Okay, if you're taking notes, sequence of return, very important. This has to do with when you reach 59 and a half and or age of retirement, meaning you walk away from your main source of income, say your career. Maybe you're someone that never started a business, but you have a career, you got a pension, Social Security, and you got your 401k. <clears throat> I just lost my train of thought. Where was I? Someone help me out here. 59 and a half. I was about to say, ah, sequence of returns. There was sequence. If there was a way we could reduce the loss of a year when the stock market goes down, because does the stock market just go down in, in, in one shot? No, like throughout the whole year, it's going up, it's going down, it's going sideways, and then we're able to see what the what the level out number looks like. If I have that million, two million dollars in the 401k, and at the top of the year, earnings don't look right for Q1 of, of the different stocks or mutual funds or index funds, whatever you have in your 401k, it's gonna be helpful to know what you have in there, what's what's potentially at risk, what's volatile, what's not, and we start to see our account go down, instead of withdrawing income immediately, all as a lump sum, we could reduce that risk by maybe doing monthly withdrawals from the 401k that could help reduce loss. I don't hear too many people talk about that. We can potentially not withdraw from there and maybe withdraw from another account that maybe doesn't lose money. And that's called a buffer volatility vehicle something that you put in place as a buffer when my asset income is reducing because the asset is losing value. If I have partial of my income's cash flow savings in another location where it never loses money, it's guaranteed not to ever lose money and always be available, that could be a buffer to help mitigate that, that loss of me withdrawing money, paying fees, paying taxes, 
and having a loss, right? You can reduce that effect on the asset, let the asset recover, right? Because when you pull money from a retirement, you're selling something to get the cash. So you're selling some of the stock, you're selling whatever is, is in there to get your, your cash. If we sell too soon, right? And then it was already going down, so you sold at, at, a, at a low price or whatever, and you're also pulling income and all these other expenses that come with it, that's why very, very important to look into this sequence of return. So pros, obviously we got tax deferred, right? Growth, deduction. Sometimes uh, there's another fact, you, you can get a match with this. So I'm not hating on this. For, for me, my personal opinion coming in now, prefer this type of account does not fit my financial strategy. So therefore I don't, I don't have it because I don't like the risk. I don't like the potential that my money could, could lose value and I could lose a bunch. And I also don't like the high cost and fees to be able to get the potential returns when I maybe could do something more efficiently. Okay. I also don't like the lack of control with these types of qualified retirement accounts. Most people don't know this, but like you don't really own your 401k, your employer does. They say what you can and can invest in. I don't like that, that's just me. So the, the next type of account, something called a self-directed account, same exact things as these, we're just adding the word self-directed, right? Adding those two words, self-directed retirement accounts, simply give you more control and ownership over what you invest in. The type of things that we invest in, in these accounts, is where the strategy comes in. Most people have no strategy with their 401k. It's just whatever the employer said and then you just, you dump money in and you hope and pray for an average rate of return. When you self-direct, there's more control, there's more ownership, there's more accountability on, on yourself, more responsibility. I like that. I like more responsibility when it comes to my money. I like more control when it comes to my money. I like more ownership. I like the ability to be a better steward with my money if I have more control. The more control I have, the more dominion, the more authority I'll have over that thing. The less I have, the less influential I can be over that particular product. So with the self-directed account, you could invest in more things. And in a 401k, you wouldn't be able to. Okay, so that's a different type of account. And then you get to measure, say, okay, do I like that more? So you get to put your opinions. I gave you the facts, right? I gave you my opinions and you get to combine those things together and then figure out, okay, well now who do I go to find these self-directed accounts? And that's where we get to do our own due diligence and, and find people. You can message me directly and then I can do research with you and show you some options, right? Or you can be like, hey, I found this person. What do you think? And then we can do research together and figure out that next step. So self-directed. Then you have the uh, Roth IRA, which is another type of retirement account, but unlike qualified retirement accounts that provide a deduction, the contributions you make initially with the IRA, with the Roth IRA, you don't get a deduction up front. This is post-tax dollars going in to the Roth IRA, and then it grows tax-free. As of right now, you can contribute up to $7,000 into a Roth IRA. A Roth IRA can also be um, self-directed if I'm not mistaken. You can have a self-directed Roth if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong on that or, or maybe it's just a regular Roth. I have a Roth with um, Fidelity, right? Once you reach a certain amount of income, you're no longer able to contribute to a Roth, but then there's a strategy that exists. This is a fact, something called a backdoor, essentially where you have a qualified retirement account and then you uh, roll over the funds into a Roth. You still pay the taxes. You're just you're just now able to get more. You're able to get more dollars into the Roth IRA and have that money grow tax free. Um, and there's tax free distribution, right? So it grows tax free or tax deferred, and then you're able to withdraw tax free. Here's an opinion. Me personally, when it comes to my financial strategy, I want as much of my money later on in life to be tax-free. I want as much of my money to be as tax-free as humanly possible because I don't know what the taxes will be in the future. But if I have tax-free jurisdiction over this money, tax-free authority over this money, tax-free authority over this money, I don't have to worry about what taxes will be then. So that's just an opinion. It's my personal strategy. That's what I'm doing. So therefore, for now, I do have a Roth IRA. Over time, I will practice the backdoor Roth as of right now. Works uh, with, with a Roth IRA, lesser fees and costs, depending on what you invest in. You know, if you invest in mutual funds, there'll be, you know, different fees and stuff like that. But, um, and if you are 
managing the Roth IRA yourself and not someone else, you also reduce in fees. Right, because you're not paying someone to invest that for you, you're kind of doing it yourself. Next thing, you have an HSA, health savings account. In order to qualify, you have to have a certain type of health insurance that is HSA eligible. Okay, that usually means high deductible, uh, higher premium in order to get the HSA. Me personally, I pay for a health insurance plan that only costs me $200 a month. That's what I, and it's, and it's HSA eligible. And so what I do is I contribute the max, each year I've been I've been funding an HSA for I wanna say four years now, maybe five. And the money grows tax deferred and the money has the potential to be tax free and it's definitely tax free on medical expenses. So this goes into, okay, well, here's a unique strategy where instead of having all my money in one location, how most of us are taught, right? We're, we're, we're taught invest 15% of our income into what? Boom, your 401k your retirement account up to the match. And then people save money in a savings account or CD bond money market, and then they'll have their social security and their pension. Hopefully that's enough. Well, I'm seeing more and more and more that when I meet people 59 and a half and up, it's just simply not enough money. They did everything right, but it's simply not enough money. It's because of how they're distributing their wealth, sequence of return. They're getting that totally messed up. So if we had the same $2 million, but it was spread out over a multitude of different accounts, one could make the argument that that person is way more secure and guaranteeing their retirement, that they won't run out of money, the money will outlive them, and they'll have stuff to pass on. Same $2 million. Like, how can that be? If they both withdraw the same amount of income each and every year, how can that be? Has to do with fees and sequencing of returns is what is how they're. So for me, I know that my health will deteriorate no matter what, because we're mortal beings. All of us will die. There's only one person in record that has the status of coming back to life after dying for a prolonged period of time, right? There's people that died for two minutes and came back to life, sure, but there's only one person that died for three days, right? And then came, came back. Other than that, there's no one else on record that has that that flex, right? That has that status. No, no one else that I know of. You know someone, let me know. But until then, I know my health will deteriorate. I know that cost of medical expenses will increase because my health will deteriorate. It's gonna cost more money to keep me alive and keep me healthy when I'm in my 80s, 90s. There's just gonna be things that are gonna, that are gonna come up. I, knowing this, instead of me throwing majority of my money in this high potential ROI location with fees and all these different things, I'm gonna take a portion of that, I'm gonna stick it over here in this HSA, a portion, 4,150. By the way, this number increases every year. From what I've seen, usually increases by like $100 or $50. This year, it increased quite a bit from the previous year, it was like at 38 something. Same thing with the Roth IRA, it was at $6,500. They bumped it up to 7,000. So that number also tends to in increase slightly. So, so it has these max contributions. Qualified retirement accounts also have max contributions, but they're much higher, right? Much higher. So HSA, tax deferred. Also, you get the deduction off today. So that 4,150, I can write that off my taxable income that year. And that 4,150 can be invested tax deferred. Then when I reach 59 and a half, just like the other qualified retirement accounts, I can withdraw the money tax free. So let's say I need 10,000 a month and let's say I'm averaging say 6,000 a year in medical expenses. Let's say that's 500 bucks a month. Instead of pulling the full 10, my qualified retirement account, I could actually less for that for that year, right? By by $500. So now I'm only pulling out $9,500. Because when I pull out the 10, does it cost more money to withdraw 10,000 out of this retirement account versus 9,500 here and 500 bucks here? Let me see some comments. Which which will cost me more? I'm pulling out the same dollar amount, 10,000. 95 here, 500 here, or just the full 10 here. Which will cost me more money? Me pulling out in two locations or me pulling out in one location? I want to make sure you're still with me. Who's with me? Who's with me? More expensive. 401k would cost more, I would think. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else? Tim says 401k. So we're all in agreement. Cool. But let's let's prove it now. Thea says 401k would cost more. Okay. Let's prove that. I pull out 
10,000 I have to still pay in this account. And because I pulled $500 more out of here, I had to sell, uh, you know, more stock, let's say. So I now have less money compounding in that account because I pulled the full 10. That extra $500 difference there, I'm paying a higher tax on, on the withdrawal on my income. That alone, you tally all that up, it's more than tax-free. That's about as simple as it gets. $500 is tax-free. So the, so the net, even though I pulled out the same dollar amount, I'm only paying taxes on the 95. The other guy is paying taxes on 10. I pulled out only what I needed from here. Mind you, the account's been growing tax-free, tax deferred, just like this one. And now, tax-free withdrawal. So I don't have to pull out as much money. I can just pull out exactly what I need to cover my medical expenses on a monthly basis or whenever they, whenever I go to the doctor. Maybe I only go to the doctor four to six times a year in my you know, late 60s or, or 70s, or whatever it is, um, and whatever prescriptions I'm on or whatever I'm, I, might, I may or may not be taking. I, I don't I, I, with this, what's really cool is you get a debit card with these types of HSA accounts. Some of them, not all of them, but uh, one, uh, one I had in the past, you, you get a debit card. So you literally like swipe it right there on the spot. That's pretty cool. So you can have some money in your HSA like cash, right? And then you can have a portion of it invested, right? And so you're able to return that money that you grew over time in a, in a particular sequence into paying less in cost and fees. So many people undervalue cost, fees, and taxes. We're just looking at one metric. So in this community, my goal is to teach everyone to look at multiple metrics of how we make our decisions with these types of accounts. Okay. So we're just going through what these do, how these actually benefit you. And we're just looking at the core of it. Once we look at the core, then we can look at a strategy that gets attached to the particular product. In the case of the HSA, it gave you the facts, tax deferred, tax deduction, tax free withdrawal on med medical expenses. Here's a strategy that some people will do. When they have medical expenses prior to 59 and a half, they don't spend it from here. They, ke they keep spending it out of pocket in their expenses. They then track the expenses of qualified medical expenses. There's a template that you can download and you can just Google it, qualified medical expenses on your HSA, right? It gives you a whole list, all kinds of things that you'd be like, what? So you track all that. Let's say you spend, I'm 28 years old. Let's say from 28 to 59 and a half, I spend $150,000 on medical expenses, qualified medical expenses expenses whole time, <clears throat> 28 to 59 and a half. And in my case, it would be like 24 to 59 and a half, 150 grand. Let's say there might be four or 500,000 built up in there, right? Through, through investments long, long term. As long as I kept good record, I can claim deduction on all those qualified medical expenses as a reimbursement, tax-free income to myself year over year, up to that number, if you were to do that, because there is no um, expiration date on when you can claim your deductions on, on medical expenses. You can just save, save the receipts, save the receipts. I'm, I'm doing that now. So let's say you did that with me. Here's where the strategies Here's, here are our opinions. This is an opinion of, of what I'm doing, but it's a strategy and it, and it proves to have, so if I need 10,000 a month and I've got $150,000 of tax-free income built up in this account here, you say, okay, um, if I want 150 to last 30 years, five grand, so I could pull out an extra $400. I could pull out an extra, like we just run the math. Okay, uh, 150 grand, we can make it shorter. I'd buy 15 years, buy by 12, all right, 10,000, buy by 12, 833. So I could pull out, let's just say an extra $800. 1,300 coming out of the HSA. If I need 10,000 to live off of, minus 1,300. Now how much am I pulling out of here? $8,700 out of my qualify retirement account. Who pays less? Person that pulls out 10K? The person that pulls out 87 here and 1300 here because that's 1300 net covers certain bills and expenses. This keeps going, right? So that's a strategy on top of two financial products. Then it's just a matter of, well, how do I figure out the timing makes sense for me to start contributing to an HSA, let's say, or qualify retirement account 
or self-directed Roth IRA, right? And we haven't even gone through the rest yet. When does it make sense? I think this is where we need counseling because this simple answer from a financial uh, a perspective, a financial influencer, coach, right? The simple answer for me to say is as soon as possible. The earlier, the better. It's easy to say, right? But that's not as uh, applicable because one could start contributing to a 401k, start contributing to a Roth IRA, start contributing to HSA. Then you get the whole life. You get to this, you get to that. And then you're like, Oh my God, my cash flow is so low. I don't know where my cash flow is at. Oh, now I'm negative. Oh, now I got to borrow from my 401k to pay off this debt. And then we start destroying these products because we haven't got this down. So the FOMO that I just gave you was, well, you want to get these things as soon as possible. You don't want to listen to that person. Not even me. Not even when I talk about it in my videos and I sound, you know, influential or excited or I'm sh displaying passion. Don't let this eat you up. Make sure this is solid on solid ground. Then we make a conscious decision with counseling or coaching, someone that we can work with trust to get to that next level and we process it together and we say, okay, well, if we know we're not going to touch this money, we, we, it would be best to put it in a location where maybe it's less accessible, where they penalize you when you pull the money out, right? It just creates that extra uh, protection from yourself that we don't drain uh, these types of accounts. I want to make sure we're doing the right thing with our money. So I just gave you FOMO. You have to process it and say, nope, I need to know my numbers first. I need to take it through my financial decision-making process, take it to my coach, get some counseling on it, talk to the wife, blah, 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 pray on it, boom, then we move forward. That's how, that's proper timing. Have to have your numbers in line. We run it through a financial decision-making process, whatever that is for you. Once we've done it, we do our due diligence, do our research, then we make the decision. Then it becomes a, a like we stack it over time. As you make more money, as you pay off more debt, as you increase your cash flow, we have to give your cash flow purpose. If we don't give every dollar in your economy purpose, it will get spent somehow, some way it eventually goes, right? So it's so important we have to give our money purpose or else end up becoming a servant to our money instead of the reverse. Money should serve us. We don't serve money, we serve God. Group here, and if you're not of the faith, you serve yourself. That's better than serving money, right? If I had to put it at a, on a scale here, someone that doesn't believe in the room, right? Or someone catching the recording, you necessarily you don't go to church, you don't really, the best thing you, you would wanna do is, is serve self first, get yourself, get your house, get your kingdom in order before you can become more uh, abundant, right? Be more effective. Like you, you, you gotta improve your skills first. And that's not selfish at all to work on yourself so that you can be more available to others and, and give, right? And that's what ends up being the most uh, efficient. And then those that do believe, okay, we serve God first. God gives us resources because we don't serve self. See how I flipped it? If I'm serving God, I don't need to serve self because I'm being provided for already. The person that doesn't believe, they have to serve themselves because there's no one providing for them. Makes sense. Talked about the HSA. We talk about this a lot in this community. Pretty straightforward. Provides a death benefit and living benefits. If you get sold on that, anything else is going to be a benefit. Benefit. And this is what I've been doing lately with my clients one-to-one, -one, those I've been talking to that are wanting to do the infinite banking concept, let's say. You want to become your own banker. Too many of us are getting sold on that. And that is, hey, to, to my fault because more most of the videos are titled infinite banking concept, how to do the strategy, how to incorporate it. That's sort of my fault. This is how I'm improving the content, sharing with people now, okay, look, let's get, let's understand the core value of this product, how it actually works. If we get sold around that, if that makes complete sense, then these added strategies and opinions are just going to enhance the, the base of the product itself. So whole life has a death benefit, has living benefits, living benefits being the cash value. With the whole life product, there's no um, age limit when you can take money out, right? So you can put money in the first year and you can take it out that same year. So it's more flexible than all of these accounts above. Type of product is not an investment. It's a protective financial product. It protects, it also protects 
the person investing in these accounts, their human life value. Life value protects the portfolio. You get sold on that, this will do you very well because you're like, I'm protecting my human life value. I'm protecting my portfolio. Remember I was talking about earlier having a buffer volatility vehicle. Buffer volatility vehicle. So whole life acts as a buffer in terms of the living benefit, the, the cash value. The money grows tax-free, right? Just like a Roth, money grows tax-free in here. It's after-tax dollars going in, grows tax-free. You can withdraw the money tax-free. You can borrow from the money. So if there was a year where my retirement accounts lose value and I have, let's say, the same $2 million, maybe I got a million dollars here. Maybe I got 200000 in the Roth, 200000 in the HSA, one, two, one, four, and say you got six hundred k in, in whole life. The money in the whole life, when my million loses 10%, instead of pulling money that year from the 10 k pull it from the whole life, pull some from the HSA, pull some from the Roth IRA until, boom, the account recovers and it goes up again. So that was your buffer just for that one year. Huge benefit there. Opinion, this is opinion and strategy when it comes to how we save money versus how we invest in, in my brain it's two different dollars they're both us dollars but they operate differently the purpose of my savings dollars is to never lose the savings dollar right so i only save my money in whole life insurance and i invest my money in a brokerage account or that could be considered a retirement account so i invest my money in a brokerage account right here. I invest my money in a Roth IRA. I invest my money in a HSA. I save my money in a whole life when I borrow against it, invested in these different accounts. You get sold on the core. We talked about the core facts, death benefit, living benefits, human life value protection, protects the portfolio. It's a buffer volatility vehicle. Great. The strategy is the idea of becoming your own, the the concept, the process of self-financing certain things to recapture interests and costs, the idea of, of having your own capital vehicle to invest in other projects and create positive arbitrage, and the idea of being able to have my savings dollars get a higher rate of return internally in the policy that would outperform a CD, a bond, a money market, a checking, a high yield saving. It'll outperform all of these things over a 10 plus year period. And if I plan on having this my whole life until death, it, it then pays a final benefit, a massive payout to the heirs, and then they can distribute it across all their accounts. And it that starts the process of creating generational wealth, from generation to generation, in, in such a unique way that the money never runs out. Give you facts, opinions, Timing. When do I get it? When should I get a whole life, Denzel? Simple answer. As soon as possible. You need to get it now. If you're 50, if you're 40, if you're 50, 35, you're 30, you're 28, you should get whole life now. It's your most fundamental product itself. See all the FOMO that I'm giving you? I got to run it through my processing system, Denzel. I got to do some due diligence, do my homework, run the numbers, make sure I have enough cash flow to fund this thing for my whole entire life. What's practical? What's reasonable? Does this fit into my current system, my current financial plan to get me out of what I'm currently doing to improve my situation. Yes? Okay, great. Yeah, it would make sense to to save money first because we don't maybe we don't know how to invest. Most people don't know how to invest, right? We don't even know where to invest. So I think it's more efficient to learn how to save first. Have a savings system, build capital, learn about a particular industry that you can invest in and learn and then you can pull capital from your savings because what is the purpose of savings for a future expense if that future expense is an investment or that future expense is an emergency it can solve for both next product we have an annuity okay what is an annuity provides lifetime income it is like a pension provides a guaranteed income for life that's what pensions do they provide guaranteed income for life that's what an annuity does now why would someone buy an annuity? Well, the reason why an annuity is popular also has to do with sequence of returns withdrawal rate. So, you, so within an annuity, you can get a higher withdrawal rate on the same dollar amount than you would a qualified retirement account and the money's guaranteed not to run out while that person's living. So this is specifically 
designed for older people. I would say my opinion, right? So I just gave you fact is a product that provides lifetime income, operates like a pension. It has a higher withdrawal rate on the same dollar amount. So if we're looking at a hundred grand in an, in an annuity or a hundred grand in a whole life or a hundred grand in a Roth or a hundred grand in a qualified retirement account, you could safely guaranteed withdraw money as income out of an annuity longer than any other product here on the board guaranteed so let me put that on there as well the word guaranteed the word guarantee does not exist in a Roth IRA doesn't exist in HSA doesn't exist in self-directed uh, retirement accounts doesn't exist in qualified retirement accounts you, you no one can say that you're guaranteed to have all this money there when when you get to said age but in a, in a whole life there's guarantees and in an annuity there's guarantees. So <clears throat> opinion, give you opinion now, who is the annuity for? I would say people who are 50s and up is when this starts to make more sense. But if you're in your 50s and you don't have a lot of capital, this is an opinion, then an annuity wouldn't make sense for that person. Me personally, because within an annuity, we're not exactly getting a high ROI. It's not really even about rate of return. Although when you go on the internet, you'll see people compare an annuity to a retirement account. And it's like, it's night and day. They solve for different things. That's important to know that each and every one of these financial products, you should not fear them just because Dave Ramsey, just because anyone else says that they're terrible, a scam. It's like, no, they exist for a purpose, for a reason. What was it originally designed for? Why did the product come into existence in the first place? Who thought of this, right? You get to the root and just look at the facts. Then you can say, yeah, that product is for me. Nope, nope, nope. That product's not for me, Denzel. I can't have an HSA right now because I have a great uh, medical plan with my employer. It covers myself, my wife, and my five kids. All of them are covered. So if I was to get off of that to get a higher premium, high deductible, just to qualify for the HSA, that's going to ruin my cash flow by $600 a month, Denzel. That just doesn't make sense for me right now. You see what I did there? Because that husband, that father, knew his numbers, didn't have FOMO, ran it through his financial decision-making process and said, hey, yeah, you know, they just say sounds great, but it's just not for my family at the very moment. So, boop, put an X, we go over to the Roth. We go over to the self-directed account. We go from over to come over the whole life. We, we look at different things. Take the emotion out of it. It's just, it's boom. The math will tell us. Boom, based on where you're at in life, blah, 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 boom, boom. This does not solve for where you're currently at in that person's situation. HSA makes perfect sense for me. I have a low medical insurance expense per month, $200 a month. It's HSA eligible, no kids, and um, I don't, I'm don't. i not employed, so I don't have an employer giving me a great health plan, and I'm very healthy, young. I don't even really go to the doctor anymore. I actually go to doctors that don't take health insurance. They work outside of insurance. It's more private. So it makes perfect sense for me to have an HSA for when those expenses do begin to get more and more expensive in life, right? Makes sense. I'm 28 years old. It does not make sense for Denzel to have an annuity right now. It makes absolutely no sense for me to lock up my capital inside an annuity and I can't really access it till till a much later age in life. I, I think annuities work the same way like 401ks. Could be totally wrong. Um, 59 and a half. I might be totally wrong about that. But there is a lock period where, where, where that, that money grows unless it's what's called an immediate annuity where you put a lump sum in and then it immediately pays out a stream of income for the for the rest of that uh, person's life. So annuity just doesn't make sense for me financially. That doesn't mean annuities are a scam or don't work. Just simply means that this is not for me. But I have a client who's in their 60s and they're a widow. And when the husband passed, they had a, 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 a life insurance payout, lump sum of money. And the wife is not an expert in finance. The husband took care of the finances majority of the time, does not know how to manage money, does not know how to invest, knows how to save, and knows how to operate within a certain range of her income, knows how to manage that. So an annuity would be perfect for her because she has a lump sum of capital, doesn't know what to do with it. If we don't give our money purpose, what happens? We spend it, we lose it, eventually goes away. We know this. So the best thing she could do is take either a large portion of that 
capital that she just received in, in death benefit, stick it into an annuity, and it would pay a stream of income guarantee for the rest of her life that could potentially supplement what husband was bringing in in income and her lifestyle doesn't have to change now that she no longer has a spouse that was bringing in a, a, another stream of income, let's just say. That would be incredible for her to consider rather than her looking at, okay, an annuity is only gonna pay uh, maybe three, four, five, six percent, if that. I could take this half a million dollars and throw it into this real estate syndication with this guru I saw online, and they're giving 12 to 18 percent rate of return. So 12 to 18 percent rate of return, I could get a much higher stream of income on that half a million, but A, it's not guaranteed. 12 to 18 percent could be less, could be zero, could be nothing. Could throw the 500k in there and then the real estate syndicator dies or is a scammer and, and runs off. Or or the property, uh, there was a sinkhole under it and it just boom, went under. Or the, or the city does something and there's permits and there's delays and all all these different things, right? That can happen. That can happen big time. So would that be the best thing for that particular person? Well, that woman would have to run it through. Know our numbers. Don't get FOMO. Know the facts. Hear some opinions. Understand the strategy. What is the strategy of an annuity? To provide lifetime income. That, that, that word, guaranteed. Every person I spoke to that's above 50 plus and 60 plus, they really start to like that word. Even though the rate of return, oh my God, is not so high, that starts to be more valuable. People my age and younger, we're looking at this because we're in our producing years. How do we produce more? Arr. Or if you're 50 and, and you didn't maximize your younger years or you just wasn't a good steward or you just didn't know what you didn't know, now you're really looking at ROI because you're trying to catch up and you're getting FOMO. You're trying to catch up, you're getting FOMO. So we just look at it how it is. There's all different types of annuities. There's all different types of whole lives. There's all different types of HSAs. There's all different types of Roth IRAs. There's all different types of self-directed accounts. There's all different types of qualified retirement accounts. But I gave you the base fact of every single, there's a base and then there's you know creativity within these different things. So with annuity, you've got fixed annuities, variable annuities, index annuities, immediate annuities, right? different types. Um, you've got single, uh, what's it called? These multi-year guaranteed annuities where it plays, pays a guaranteed rate for the first couple of years and then it goes to a variable rate or whatever the case may be. So it's all different types of things. We run through your numbers, we see what we're looking at and then we make that that decision. Um, and then I just threw these in here because these are banking products. You got CDs, bonds, money markets, checking, savings, brokerage accounts. These are all areas that we can store money and then have it grow. Typically a CD will give you you know, guaranteed rate for a particular period of time. Bond, guaranteed rate for a particular period of time. Money market checking and savings, variable, but sometimes have a little rate of return. Personal opinion, I prefer to store and save dollars all in my whole life. I then borrow against that and I contribute to HSA and, and brokerage account and back to the business. An annuity doesn't make sense for me. CD doesn't make sense. For me. A bond doesn't make sense. For me. Savings account doesn't make sense for me. A money market account doesn't make sense for me. A Roth IRA, doesn't make sense for me right now, okay? But I will practice the back door later. Self-directed account, doesn't make sense for me right now. Qualified retirement account, doesn't make sense for me. Even though with a self-directed account, I have more control and ownership, even though with a qualified retirement account, I get a deduction, da, 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 all these things, they don't make sense for me, but they could make sense for you. That's the point, run it through a process. 